All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Andreas Macris, founder and president of Big Mouth Survey. I hope everybody's doing well, and thank you again for tuning into today's show. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the stock market and particularly investing ideas in a volatile market, uh, especially during these uncertain times. I have a special guest today. He is Thomas Marino. He's a financial advisor at Atrium Financial Associates. How are you doing today, Tom? I am good and uh, doing well. Oh, great, great, great. So um, today's topic I really thought was really important for a lot of viewers out there, especially during this time, you know, uh, for people that are investing or thinking about investing during this time, um, you know, so uh, Tom has put a great presentation together for us today. And uh, I hope, um, you know, we get some questions from all the viewers out there. So uh, Tom, if you could just take it away a little bit on, uh, and about your your history, your, your work experience before we get into this presentation. Sure. So um, I have uh, been in the uh, advisor space for going on about 13 years now. Um, I focus a lot on investments generating income, um, particularly for people that are at or near retirement. Um, we pay attention to um, kind of what the macro trends are out there, more so than a specific stock Um you know, we try to see trends more than, you know, say, hey, well, this is a great stock buy. This is what's going on. And try to use the economic factors as a guidance for our clients. Okay. And as far as for today's presentation, what, like, what are your thoughts? And, uh, you know, whenever you're ready to hop in, go right ahead, take over. So, yeah. So the, the first topic we want to um, kind of look at is, you know, what's going on in the financial markets today? Um while no one can really predict the future, uh, I always point that out, we, we do kind of have some concerns with uh, the way the markets are kind of setting up. So the first thing that came to mind was on Monday, um, the Chicago Fed um, released what they call the CFNIA um, index. Um, it's an index that's really kind of fascinating to watch because it has predicted um, moves into recession um, pretty consistently when numbers hit a certain level. And the one that we I particularly pay attention to is what they call the three month average of the CFNAI. And um, for the first time that was released on Monday morning, it was reported at negative 1.47. Um, anything historically below negative 0.7 has almost always indicated a recession is imminent. Um, so that, that caused me a little bit of concern. So I started doing some research on the last time we were in the session, which was 2008. And more particularly the time before that, which was um, the dot-com crash of 2000, 2001, 2002. Um, if you're around back then, you know that there was an enormous buildup of the market. So if we take a look at the slide in front of us there, um, you can see that the market really started to peak around March of 2000. Of, of the dot com and, and and there was a lot of dot coms there was you know pets dot com was the famous one and all these companies just had no earnings whatsoever um, but people were bidding them up and immediately there was a almost a 37 percent drop in the market from March down to June um, where people were like oh my gosh the market just collapsed and they're looking back um, in time saying what happened and uh, it was mostly the tech industry that happened. Then people started getting a little more confident. So by June and then of July of that same year of 2000, we actually saw the market tick up. So people were starting to get a little confidence of what was going on. But right around September of 2000, the markets just went on a free fall downward. And they ended up spending the next year dropping about 75% um, of their value and all the way down to September 11th. Sorry, could you move your cursor just as you're describing so everybody can kind of follow that chart if possible? Oh, yeah, okay, sure. So so here, here we see the market right here um, yeah. at, at its peak, and that is March of 2000. Um, then we have this drop right here, um, which brings you to really, you know, May, June of 2000. And then you get this little peak. You get almost a back-to-back -back peak. So people at that time were really starting to feel – I'm pretty confident of, of what was going on. Uh, and I said, okay, I think we recovered from that huge loss. 
and the markets are coming back. They didn't come back as much as they lost, but they, they did bounce back. And they had a double bounce back to just before September of 2000, which is right here. Mm. The question I put, and I really, this really should be a question mark because it says you are here is a question mark um, in, in 2020 because then the markets really went on a slide all the way down. Um, and by September of uh, 20, to, really this is 9-11, which is right here. Okay. Um, where, where, where they where they hit their 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 market and and that became really the bottom of the market. So the, the question was, you know, if you lost and, and of course if you stayed on board for the next you know several years, you eventually recovered that loss. Um, but the question is, what's your time frame that we're dealing with here? Um, that a lot of people really had a hard time recovering from because if you lose that much value, um, there's something called the arithmetic of loss. Um, you have to make more than 75% to get your money back, just to, just to get even. Yeah. So, so I tell people the avoidance or risk of loss is much, much more important than the gain potential gain you can get. So avoiding losses, particularly big losses, is, is important. So sometimes you hear people with the buy and hold strategy, well, that can be valuable for long periods of time. If you can avoid those losses in the first place, it's probably even, even better or just minimize the losses. And, and so I look back to what asset classes have done well. If we look back to 2000, 2001, 2002, um, asset classes that did really well during this, really this extended bear market that we saw, um, which is where I think we could be entering or where we are right now in, in 2020. It was asset classes like bonds, real estate, um, utilities, and gold. And if you look at those asset classes today, those are the asset classes doing actually pretty well. Um, if we look, if we look at the financial markets today, what's going on? So if we're entering this bear market, if we're entering a recession, those are the asset classes that are probably going to do better than your your equities, um, particularly international equities. We we haven't seen um, really this kind of you know event ever play out, but we have you know the global economy for the first time in a very long time, and maybe going back to World War II, where fifty percent of the world is in lockdown. Um, so we're going to start running into problems maybe with supply chains. Um, we're going to start running into problems where countries are, are vying for parts. Uh, maybe it might be automobile parts um, because 100 percent of very few things is built in one particular country today. So I think this stays with us for a little bit right now. Um, so it's going to be a struggle. But the good news is I, I do feel very confident over time that we will rebound from this. Um, but I do think for the next you know, six to 12 months, we're going to be in a struggle of trying to keep things moving forward. And do you think most people are going to play conservative conservative strategy moving forward? Well, well we're seeing we're seeing two strategies right now. Some people think um, we're we're at this dip right now. Let, let let's invest, um, and that could be the right case. Like I said, I said in the beginning, I don't know um, where these are coming from. Um, I do rely on economic indicators, and the economic indicators do state there is a recession coming. Um, that to me is a little alarming. So yes, you could get good prices, but they can go lower. And I point that out every time saying that we don't know. Um, I do have clients that come to me and say, hey, is this a goodbye, is that a goodbye? Um, I don't really get that specific um, on those. I tend to follow sectors more so. Like if someone says, you know, what sectors would you be in? I'd be totally maybe in, you know, consumers, consumer goods might be good. Um, mm -hmm. We're all like the grocery stores doing really well. Um, that kind of stuff I think is going to survive quite well, but I, I think anything in the entertainment world is going to really um, struggle. Um, I do think anything in the tourist world is really going to struggle um, until the world gets back to normal, which it will, but I think it's going to take some time. Yeah, yeah. So uh, next question that we're going to go into, what are the main risks when you're near or in retirement? Well, uh, you know. So, yeah, so so one of the things that we just covered is okay. So if you're half time and you, you've lost a bunch of money, you can kind of wait it out in the market. You're young, you can probably buy some stuff cheap. But what if you're not? What if you're five years or more or less, or you're actually in retirement? And and one of the things that we saw um, in the financial crisis was that bonds were a really good balance um, 
to the equities. And even back going back to the dot-com crash, same, same issue going on. Um, but you have real risks that most people don't realize. So I, I, I kind of compare it to climbing a mountain. So when you're climbing a mountain, um, and there's a real good example this past, um, I guess it was 2019, this past May in 2019, um, when, you're, when people were climbing Everest. And there was a fair amount of people that died last year on Everest. And the reason was most of them summited. They reached the peak. They've collected as much stuff as they could, and they summited. But what happened? On the way down the mountain, the markets changed. And I think over 15 people actually died um, coming down Everest. They didn't die reaching the summit. They died coming down the mountain. And the reason I point that out is because coming down the mountain requires very different skills than going up the mountain. And, and this is what I call the real risks of retirement. And most of us are not trained in this aspect of spending versus collecting. You know, we spend a lot of time collecting. We spend a lot of time summiting that mountain. And, and so the biggest risk we face, hands down, is longevity. Yeah. And because people really are living a long time. Um, it's an unknown risk of, of what that's going to happen right there. Um, and then we really have, because of longevity, we have three other risks that, that play into that. Um, the first risk is what I call the, the, the market risk. You have investment volatility, you have interest rate volatility, um, taxes could change. Um, one that people don't really understand is called sequence risk. Um, that's really, really important because if you retire into a negative market, that's probably about the worst thing you possibly do to your portfolio. Um, and it, it, it will play very poorly for longevity of that portfolio, um, running those numbers. So if you're not aware of what sequence risk is, um, you should be, because um, it's, it's really thing. Of course, we're all familiar with inflation. Inflation has been relatively low for the past 10 years, um, but we're dumping a lot of money into the economy. Maybe it takes off, maybe it doesn't, we don't know. Um, and then personal spending. Um, I see this you know, with a lot of uh, older clients where they're getting medical expenses that they didn't even know were existed. So they're seeing a lot of rising costs. So these are things that when you're working, you're not really paying that much attention to because your income is coming in, um, the markets do that, go down. Your first reaction is, "Oh, it's okay. We're just gonna we're gonna buy stocks cheaper. We're gonna we're gonna get a better deal, and, and we're just gonna hold these for a long time." And that's a really good strategy um, for that period. But as you get closer to stopping work, and and the easiest way to explain this is, um, many 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 people understand the concept of dollar cost averaging. They're like, this is the greatest thing in the world. But what they don't understand is when you're spending, dollar cost averaging is your biggest enemy in a negative market. It, it, it destroys your portfolio. Mm. And so that's, that length of a portfolio is really the fundamental question you need to be asking yourself. You know, if you're unhealthy and you're going to die in a few years, probably not a big deal. But, but that's not the reality for most people. So, so those are the risks we want to be aware of. And uh, we can move on to our, our next step because then the next question is so now we know what the risks are differently as we begin to age when we're in retirement then the next question is well how do you manage those risks you know how do you manage vol volatility how do you manage longevity well there's really four different strategies you can use and they all work to some degree so one of them is you could spend conservatively just spend less so I have some clients that they, they have enough assets and they ask me, what should I do? I was like, you know, you you have plenty of extra money. Let's just slow down your spending. And they're okay with that. That strategy works. They don't need to take excessive risk. They can only stay in cash and be perfectly fine. Um, a, another way to manage that, that is spending what I call spending flexibility. When the markets aren't doing well, well, you don't go take that second trip. You don't take that, that bonus trip. You say, you know what, this year we're not going to go. Um, take that trip to wherever we want it to go. And we're going to, that's called spending flexibility. And as, as the markets do well, you say, hey, we have some extra money, let's spend it. You, you can kind of do that. Um, a third possibility is, is what I call reduced volatility. Um, and that's by using really investment products that, that limit that. And historically, that's been done with the bond market. Now, the bond market is at an historically low rate, um, rates, on the 10-year right now, I think I saw this morning we're at 0.6%. Uh, 
um, that's unsustainable for someone that's relying on trying to reduce the, the volatility of equity markets using the bond markets. So we've seen some insurance products pop, pop up, particularly some annuities that are actually getting much, much better um, volatility reduction. Um, and people are really becoming attracted to these, whether they're fixed or variable, there's 1800 different kind of types of annuities out there. Um, you should put them as, as a possibility in your portfolio, particularly to manage your bond risk. Uh, as a bond alternative, they're, they're probably one of the best, the best tools out there right now that we're seeing. Um, in reference to buffered assets, um, we do have some clients that, that just want to kind of avoid the avoid those losses because we were talking about, hey, if you could avoid that 70% loss back in the dot com, your, your recovery time is going to be a lot faster. Mm -hmm. um, there are some structured products out there available um, that you can do that will basically, uh, you know, you take the first 10%, but then you're out of the market after that. There's some investment strategies out there. So there's a very, various things that you can do. And these buffered products work pretty well. Um, so th those are the, really the, the th four types of strategies you can do to manage volatility when you're in retirement or near retirement, these are the strategies you want to be incorpor incorporating. Again, it's a very different message than what you might be hearing out there as you're working because no one's talking about these strategies. They're very different. Now, what about a strategy? And I'm sure this is probably not relevant, but I used to hear sometimes people use uh, life insurance as a investment strategy. It was that? Yeah. So, 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 yeah, so you can use life insurance. Um, it's a very sound strategy. Um, it it really becomes a uh, an affluent um, uh, purpose on, on what you're going to do. So the beautiful part about life insurance is you're basically leveraging your health, and some of these products can actually amass a fair amount of of tax free money um, that you can pull out later in life. They generally have pretty long time horizons. So you're probably talking a minimum of 15 years um, okay. before you can really start pulling cash out of them. Um, where we're seeing with most of the, the people, they're using it going back to um, the personal spending um, risk bucket. We're seeing a lot of people use um, life insurance to manage their long-term care risk more so than their, their spending risk. Um, so yeah, it's been used. So, Long-term care contracts have really come under pressure, so we're not seeing the traditional long-term care insurance. But what we're seeing is a merging of people saying, "Hey, you know what? I realize that's a risk." And and, and here's the, the the even the the worst part is people are seeing what's happening today with this um, virus in nursing homes, yeah. and they're scared to death. To even oh my gosh, it's a death sentence if I go in there. Um, they're really concerned, so they're saying, "What are some options that I can manage my care at home?" So people are looking at strategies today going, maybe I should look at these types of structures where I can, you know, basically hedge my health today. And if I need to get in-home care, I'll have enough money. And then they're really, really effective for leveraging that. So if you have um, assets out there that are just being used conservatively, they're sitting in a bank account, um, they're not really, you don't want them too volatile. You can really use life insurance to leverage long-term care risk right now. It's, it's a really good strategy that we're seeing. Um, the, the last thing that we want to cover is, is spending rates, um, because the, the next question is, you know, we're in this historic low rate environment, right? And people just like traditionally, it's like, hey, if I just pull this out, we talked about the longevity risk. Um, there's really, as I see it, um, only a handful of ways we can manage this. Um, so, really, so if we take a look, this is as of March 2020 uh, that we have here. And when I talk about spending, it's what is the sustainable rate of money I can pull from my portfolio that I know has a 90% chance, right? Has a 90% chance that it's going to be there when I am still there, mm -hmm. right? So three different strategies. A conservative side says 95% in, in fixed income, right? Only 25% allocation to stocks. A moderate 50-50. Um, and the aggressive is only 75% in equities. So if I just simply say right here, fixed spending, no growth, um, I can spend 2.77% of my portfolio. A good way to look at this, uh, here's, here's one that I think, that, let's just look at some numbers because I find percentages and numbers are probably a little bit different. So let's look at a moderate investor 
they are going to say, you know what? I have a $500,000 portfolio. I can spend 3.73% and not run out of money and stay 50% equities, 50% fixed income, right? And this is as of March with fixed income rates be, being down. That's only $15.54 per month. So $500,000 portfolio is going to give you monthly income. And this is where most people uh, are thinking is because they got monthly bills. That's going to generate you $15.54 per month, right? Now, we need to account for inflation. So if we say, okay, what if we want to adjust for inflation and actually spend a little more money um, as inflation goes up? That number goes from $15.54 a month to $1,200 a month that you can spend sustainably on a $500,000 portfolio. So, and then there's all different scenarios through here, but the key I want to point out here is that you can see that in this low rate environment, that's a real concern of what are we going to do to, to manage that? Um, and then that's what I spend a lot of time doing is sitting down with people going, okay, let's look at your expenses. What do you have guaranteed? You may have a pension, probably not though. Um, you may have social security, you know, that, that might be there, but what other sources of income do you have coming in? And like I said, a $500,000 portfolio seems like, Oh, that should be enough. It comes down to what are you spending and what's sustainable. And if you're spending more than, you know, twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollars a month out of that portfolio. There's a good chance it's going to run out of money in today's market. What products out there can I develop? What investment strategies can I develop to say, you know what, I need to protect my future because if we go back to the market and we go back to the environment and we enter this recession, um, one of the things I mentioned was sequence risk. So if you're at or near retirement, or here's even the sadder part: is as the economy slows down. The people that were kind of thinking they were going to work for a little bit longer, they might not be hired back. They might say, hey, listen, we're going to get the business up and running, but why don't you take an early retirement package and move on? Like, that's what happens a lot of times. Maybe they get this virus and recover. What was that? Not sure. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so maybe they, they, they have to quit their job because of health reasons, because of all this going on. Maybe they're having some stress and they said, you know what, I just can't go back to work or whatever it is. Those are actually the most common reasons why people retire. And all of a sudden you're moving into retirement in this down market. It's a very, very dangerous time to be doing that. And so what I do is I'll, I'll work with somebody and say, hey, listen, what, what, what options do we have? What, what, what can we look at? How do we mitigate this risk? And if you have plenty of assets, you can live off 2% for your portfolio. You're probably going to be fine and we can stay very conservatively. But if that's not the case, you really got to be looking at some different things. You know, maybe you have, you know, what, whatever, and manage your expenses and all this. And everybody is very different. And so I, I try to sit down with people and tell them, you know, let's look at your, your monthly expenses. What do you need in monthly income? And it's, it's something that... I find a lot of people uh, don't really focus on because they're like, oh, just, just ride it out. Just, you know, the, the stock market will come back and your portfolio will come back. You know, I'm looking with people who's like, well, that's not a choice right now. We have to, we have to, make, we have to make a decision today um, with what we're going to do to move forward because we need this money to, to generate income. And, and that's why it's kind of all connected. And so when I sit down with somebody, I know where they are in the stage of life. You know, where, where, what, you know and there's a lot of things you can't predict. Um, but planning at this time of year become is really, really important because you could have a plan and what happens when it falls apart. You know, that, that's kind of what I, I try to tell people. I'm like, okay, we got plan A, things do well, we're good. We got plan B, just in case. You know, and, and, that, and that's really what, what you're doing. I, I think it, everyone has different tolerance for risks, and, and that's really what we want to kind of do. Um, but the, the other concern of the stock market that people aren't pulling out, we mentioned this right here on the historic low interest rates, that's a real, real, real problem uh, that people aren't really paying attention to because it's a lot of people traditionally have used the bond market in particular as the balance when things get really volatile and the bond market is, you might as well just be sitting on cash in your, in your, in your closet. You know, it's, 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 it's odd. And in fact, um, if you look around the world, we're seeing negative interest rates. We talked about negative oil yes. um, at one point and we're seeing there, there's been negative interest rates around the world right now in Japan and Germany. Um, 
it's it's uh, Switzerland. I mean, we're we're seeing some really historically scary times out there for the bond rates. They've been like that for a while. And the U.S. has kind of been exempt from all that, and now we're seeing uh, the ten-year down so low. People are like, well, maybe it can happen in the U.S. too. So, so yeah, those are all the things that you really want to pay attention to. So, what is there any advice for somebody that you know does not have a financial advisor, uh, somebody that's unsure of what to do in this market? You know, do you have any advice of where they should start and how to educate themselves? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, I tell everybody, I, I talk to anyone. Um, I, I don't really have um, people out there like, like, oh, you need a minimum of X number of dollars to, to talk to people. There's a lot of advisors out there that are like that. Um, find somebody that does that. I mean, there's, we do fee-based planning. We do asset under management planning. Uh, we, we do a bunch of different fee structures as, as an advisor. Um, there's find them out there and, and ask them questions. Um, and if you just want to trade stocks and do all that, there's those advisors out there too. Um, but find something that really fits your needs. You know, there's, if you just want to invest, there's people uh, doing that kind of stuff. But if you want to, do more holistic planning and look at really what I think is really more valuable is income. Um, find the people out there doing income planning. Find the people out there that are that are doing that kind of work. And um, uh, like I said, I I'll talk to anybody. I have clients that are uh, very affluent. I have clients that aren't so affluent, and um, I, we work with all of them. We don't really, you know, it, we might not be able to help them directly, but we can give them advice and uh, help them. I've worked with clients just. Their main problem right now is trying to establish a budget. Yeah, and, and 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 I say to them, you know, hire me as your financial fitness coach, and let's just sit down and do a budget every month. I I, I joke with people like, like we've been in this weird environment of working from home. I'm a big exercise person, and when I go to the gym, every exercise we do is, you know, burpees, push-ups, um, running around the gym things I could hundred percent do on my own, but one month later, I'm not doing them on my own. And, and I call it your financial accountability coach. And I just sit down with everybody a month. They pay me like a monthly fee and they hire me just to do budgeting for them. That's it. Cause and, and you're talking people that some have lots of money. Some don't, it's just not a skill that most people have. Um, but it's really important um, to do that kind of work. Now I, I've been uh, researching and doing a little bit of investigating on currency trading. Um, do you have any experience in currency trading at all? I, I don't. Um, I, I do follow the market still a little bit. I don't do any, any currency trading. Um, I do think the U.S. dollar is, is where you want to be right now. Mm -hmm. um, the U.S. dollar is just continuing just to dominate. It's, it's the worldwide currency. And I think as we move into this um, crazy worldwide event that we're going under, the U.S. dollar is just going to remain dominant. And, so yeah, so we'll, we'll we'll see where that goes. But yeah, I, we don't do currency trading. Understood. Now, do you think, as far as for the U.S. currency, do you think it's going to stay dominant? Uh, I mean, do you I, I like I, I study macro markets more more so than than specific currencies. But just look at really what's happening in the world. Is there's very the, the global reserve currency hands down is the dollar, and. It's been tried to unseat it. You've seen the, the BRIC countries trying to come together to form their own um, trading currencies, and that's kind of falling apart. It's falling apart every single time. Now, um, the U.S. dollar's also been closely tied to oil, and you see what's happening in the oil market. So that could become an issue. Um, so, yeah, so I question whether it will be, but I don't see anybody replacing the U.S. dollar in the near future. It's just, it's you know, you get the cryptocurrencies, the crazies out there in the world that are you know, doing all that kind of stuff and that can be a fun like board game to play <laughs> uh, but but yeah um I, I don't think i see any like virtual currency i don't see any actual country unseating the u.s dollar at this point just because it's all the countries are going through what we're going through right now and, and I, I i follow economics more so than i follow the specifics understand so right before we close it up, is there anything else you would like to touch on or, you know, uh, give out? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the only thing I, I would say is try to look at the economics versus the news hype, the CNBCs of the world and all that kind of world that's going on around there. Because 
the economic numbers tend to be at least somewhat agnostic. And, and, and remember that the market is always trying to look forward, um, particularly the, the stock market, the Dow, the S&P and all that. They're trying to look forward of where corporate earnings are going to be. And eventually corporate earnings fall in line with where the market expectations are. And right now there's a lot of uncertainty around those earnings. So I would expect, you know, a there's, there's going to be a reckoning at some point, whether the earnings are going to go up or the market's going to come down to meet those earnings because the numbers that are initially coming in are really, really low. Um, but the market's saying, well, maybe they're not as bad as they think because maybe by the fall, things will be rocking. So that's kind of what the market's saying right now. But I like to follow the bond market more so than the the equity markets because I think the bond market is a better predictor mm. of what's going on. And you see it in, with the, the very low rate structure, the bond market right now is kind of indicating that eh, this isn't going away anytime soon. You know, and, and that, that really to me is a, is a good indicator. So those are markers that I follow um, more so than, you know, how many points did that went up, how many points did that went down. Um, I just kind of follow corporate earnings, the bond market, um, those kind of things that, and the, you know, and, I, and like I said, I love the Chicago Fed number if you really want to see what's going on. Um, it's not an index that's quoted, but it's a, uh, the, if you just put into uh, any Google search, CFNAI, um, you get some really good insight on what, where the economy is going because it's about 80 different sectors, including inflation, um, everything out there that, that's forecasting. It's, it's kind of a cool um, tool. All right, well, yeah. Well, thank you, Tom. I really appreciate the time today. Thank you, you know, for giving us great uh, ideas and insight on uh, investing during these uncertain times. And uh, I hope everybody uh, has a great day. Thank you for tuning in. And um, if, if you have any questions, shoot me a message. Yeah, if there's any questions, please uh, text the number um, below. We will get those questions uh, to Tom and uh, we'll get them answered for you right away. And uh, we will see you guys next time. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Tom. Pleasure. Take care.